Well, good evening. As we, as the elders, decided to um, talk about the characteristics or uh, about Jesus, uh, one of the things in the, in the suggested list where that caught my eye was the prophecies of uh, the coming of Jesus because um, I just enjoy reading about and learning about so many of these prophecies. But as I started to get into it, uh, I really felt like I was um, missing a point, and that is because there are so many prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of Jesus that uh, I, I sat down and I started, I have, I have a Bible that was um, written by Jack Van Empey. I don't know how many of you might know who Jack Van Empey was or remember him, but he was uh, just amazing. He memorized the Bible, um, and he was just amazing. And the Bible I have has every prophecy in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is highlighted in gray, and then off to the side in the margin, he says whether this was the first coming or the second coming or the millennium or the tribulation. And it was just really fascinating to go through that. I only made it through the Old Testament primarily because that's what we're talking about tonight is the prophecies of the coming of Jesus that were given in the Old Testament before those people ever knew what, what, when it was going to happen, what the Messiah was going to be like, um, and how it was going to change the nation of Israel going all the way back, obviously, to the third chapter of Genesis. And there are over 300 prophecies of the, new, the first coming in the Old Testament. There are over 300 prophecies. So um, I'm only going to give you most of them. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to, to start off by looking at the fact that we, we have to understand the uh, covenants that God made. We know that God made covenants with, uh, with Noah, with Abraham. Um, he included Isaac and Jacob. Many, many times he talked about the, uh, God talked about the um, prophecies of the uh, promised land and what he was going to do and there were going to be descendants and they were going to be, there was going to be kings and on and on and on so many of these uh, prophecies but I want to start by looking at a couple of verses in the Old Testament having to do with the covenant in Jeremiah 33 14 and I'm going to go through quite a few um, scriptures and I'm not going to necessarily take time for everyone to look them up so I have printed them um, Jeremiah 33, 14. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I fulfill the good promises that I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this is one of the things that I think we need to really concentrate on is these are God's promises. It is going to happen. Some of it has happened. Some of it is happening right now. Today, as we speak, and some of them, some of these prophecies are yet to happen, but we are guaranteed it is going to happen. Again, uh, the 15th to the 18th verse of Jeremiah 33. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to sprout up for David, and he will administer justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is what she will be named. The Lord is our righteousness. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man sitting on the throne of the house of Israel. The Levitical priest will never fail to have a man always before me to offer burnt offerings. So um, to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices. And as I, as I read that, um, in the beginning, I thought, wait a minute, it's been 2,000 years. 
since Israel had a temple, since Israel has offered sacrifices. But this doesn't necessarily say that it's going to be a continuous thing. What it does say is that they will not fail, that God will not fail. In the future, um, we know that right now we're in that church age where there is no temple. But the day will come when these things will be restored. And in Isaiah, um, Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, On that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of Israel's survivors. Whoever remains in Zion and whoever is left in Jerusalem will be called holy. All in Jerusalem written in the book of life, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the blood guilt from the heart of Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning, then the Lord will create a cloud of smoke by day and a glowing flame of fire by night over the entire site of Mount Zion and over its assemblies. For there will be a canopy over all the glory and there will be a shelter for shade from the heat of day and refuge and shelter from the storm um, and the rain. Again, he's talking about raising up the branch. We know the branch is Jesus Christ, and we know that Jesus Christ came at the first advent. But these other things haven't happened yet. The, the peace, the, the smoke, the flame, uh, cleansing the blood guilt, um, and creating um, the cloud of smoke for there will be a canopy. Those things haven't happened yet, but they will. They're going to. I want to talk about Isaiah especially because this is what I focused in on. Isaiah is so full of the prophecies of the coming of Christ that at one point I even got to the point where I thought, well, I'm not going to talk about anything but what Isaiah has, because even, even two solid chapters in Isaiah are about the coming of Christ. But I want to um, look at Isaiah uh, chapter 6, and um, this is verses 1 through 9, because he um, says at the beginning a vision, um, well, not, no, that's chapter 1, I'm sorry. Chapter 6. In the year of King Uzziah, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And the reason I wanted to read that is because this is Isaiah's commission to speak for the Lord. Um, an oracle is one who speaks the words of the deity. And this is Isaiah's initiation, his call and his commissioning to do all and write all the things that follow, uh, more than 50 chapters that follow. So he is called to be a prophet. I want to start taking a look then at some of the um, prophecies of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 42. Turn to that. 
Isaiah 42, 1 through 8. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice on the earth and the coastlands shall wait for him, uh, wait for his law. Thus says the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, new, th um, new things I declare before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. So this is the beginning of the prophecies now that we will find uh, about Jesus. But Isaiah calls himself a servant, um, and he actually says that God calls him, Behold, my servant, whom, I'm, whom I uphold. And one of the things that I, uh, I found that I hadn't really paid any attention to up until this week was the fact that Isaiah is called a servant and Jesus Christ is called a servant. And both of them are to serve and to do work for uh, God Almighty, for the Father. Isaiah 49 Verses 6 and 7. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. This is a prophecy that has now been fulfilled and is being fulfilled even today because he says, He's talking about the servant, Jesus Christ. And he says, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to, whom, to him whom man despises, to him whom nations abhor, to the servant of the rulers, kings shall see you and arise, princes shall also worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel has chosen you. And one of the things that we have to bear in mind, I, I am right now talking about the first advent, but we have to bear in mind that in many of these uh, prophecies, the prophet is talking about the first advent and moves right into the second advent. Now, obviously, most of the prophecies of the second coming of Christ are in the New Testament. But the New Testament letters and, and Gospels are, are linked to the Old Testament because even when we're told that when Jesus went to the um, uh, synagogue in Nazareth and he read from Isaiah and he said, Today... These words are fulfilled in your presence. Obviously, that caused an uproar. But what he was, even Jesus was doing, was reading from Isaiah. And many times, I think we forget that when it says that Jesus quoted the scripture, the only scripture Jesus had was the Old Testament. So we have to bear in mind that everything that Jesus talked about is in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Um, and I want to start then with, he was pierced for our transgressions. Isaiah 52, verses 13 to 15 says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. 
He shall be exalted and extolled to be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. The fulfillment of this prophecy um, we find in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Um, then that is, he will be exalted. Philippians says, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those uh, in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know that that hasn't happened yet. This is, all, this is a prophecy of the first coming, but it's also a prophecy of the second coming because we're not at that point yet where every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Also in that um, passage from Isaiah that I read in Isaiah 52, um, Mark talks about he will be disfigured. That's the fulfillment of the prophecy because Mark... Uh, 15th chapter, um, verse 17 and 19, he says, They clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns. They put on his head and began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. This is a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Um, many times I have heard uh, pastors, preachers, talking about all of the uh, prophecies that are and have been fulfilled absolutely to the nth degree, that there have been, there's been nothing left out, that all of these prophecies have been perfectly fulfilled. Statistically, that's not possible. This is only because of God. This is only because uh, God has decreed this. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12, and this is where I spend most of my time, is on Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that he, we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich, um, but with the rich at his death, because he has done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet in it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his uh, soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. 
and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So here we have the first coming, the first advent, and the second advent, because some of this hasn't happened yet, but it's in the process of happening, and that's what the church age is. He died for your sins and mine. But the important thing for us is Not only did he die and his blood covered our sins, but he rose from the grave. He's alive and we will be too with him. The fulfillment of this prophecy is that he will be rejected. John chapter 12, verses 36 to 41. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and he was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke, the Lord who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Therefore, they could not believe, because Isaiah again said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. John is writing about Isaiah, who was more than, a, um, I think, nearly a thousand years before. John is writing this. And Isaiah knows exactly because God is putting this in Isaiah's mind, in his heart, in his mouth. And Isaiah is prophesying what the Lord, the the Messiah is going to be. And those predictions, not predictions, but those um, prophecies came about absolutely perfectly. Also, the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy is that he will bear our sins and sorrows. Romans 4, 23 to 25. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who has delivered up, who was delivered up because our offenses and was raised because of our justification. We have to understand that the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed to all believers. We stand righteous before God, not because we are righteous, but because Jesus Christ is, and that has been imputed to us. At the same time, we are justified because of what Christ did in fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Also in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 25, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. But whose stripes, by whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. When I read that, especially when it says, Um, By his stripes you are healed. I see in my mind what I've seen in some of the movies like The Passion. To think that every stripe he received, 
Every lashing of the whip is healing me. Is healing you. It was a horrendous, horrendous arrest and um, trial and persecution. But Peter is telling us that every stripe was for my healing and for yours. And it gives me a whole different view of what was happening. I think it was horrendous. We all know it was horrendous. What he went through on that day that ended on the cross. But the fact is, he took that punishment. He took that having his flesh torn apart for my healing. Another fulfillment of that prophecy from um, Isaiah is that he will make a blood atonement. Again, Romans 3, 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation for his blood, through faith to, deter to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in him. The blood of Jesus Christ has atoned for my sin. I've been studying some other material um, besides preparing for this message because I became very, um, uh, I, I wanted very much to know more about this thing that I was studying. And what I have come to realize, I've known it all along. I've been told this by preachers for most of my, well, mo some of them didn't bother to tell us anything. But I'll say for the last 40 years, I have heard this message, but never really took the time to flesh it out and to realize what was being said. And that is that there are those who um, ridicule believers and those who ridicule the fact that not all people are saved. That there is only one way to heaven. That there is only one uh, Savior. And one of the arguments that many of them make is uh, a loving God would not condemn anyone to hell. The fact is everyone's condemned to hell. Every one of you, me, everyone is condemned to hell. We are all sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it is by God's grace and by his choice that he chose you and me to be saved. I think one of the things that helped me to solidify that in my mind, my understanding was um, we, don't, we don't like to watch uh, broadcast TV anymore. I, there's not a program that's on TV today that I have any desire to watch. So we're watching Little House on the Prairie and um, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, and um, a few others. I've even gone to Death Valley days. But um, recently, in the last week or so, was watching an episode of uh, Dr. Quinn. And in this episode, there was a train that came in, and they were trying to find homes for orphans from the east, from Philadelphia, I think it was. 
and they had about 20 of these kids of various ages that were, um, they were taking them out west. This is all the way out to Colorado now, and they're looking for homes for these kids. And the thing that struck me about it, and I know this, both of our children are adopted. We chose them. And, but it really struck me in this program that these 20 or so kids are there waiting to see what's going to happen, and three or four of them are chosen. Now, does that mean that the people of the town cursed the rest of them? No. What it means is that all of them who were orphans, in other words, we're all sinners, all of them who were orphans out of those in that town that day, and I realize this is a TV program, but those four were chosen. They didn't do anything to be chosen. It wasn't because they were prettier or smarter or anything else. They were orphans just like all 20 of them, but out of them four were chosen. And that's exactly a picture for me of God's grace. We're all sinners. But God chose you and me if you are a born-again believer. Those who are not chosen are going to hell because we are all going to hell. Except those who, by grace, have been chosen to become children of God. He will make a blood atonement. Another fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy is in 2 Corinthians um, 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that he might become the righteousness of God in him. Another fulfillment of this one prophecy from Isaiah comes from the 10th chapter of John. And this fulfillment is that he will accept our guilt and our punishment. The 10th chapter of John, verse 11, says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. It can't be any clearer than that. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. We are the sheep. And he says, a good shepherd gives his life. For the sheep. Jesus is still doing that. He's doing that today. He's doing that this evening. He has given his life for you. If you have accepted him. As Lord and Savior. If you haven't yet. Why do you wait? He has given his life for you. Another fulfillment is that he will be buried in a rich man's tomb. Pam and I have had the blessing, the opportunity to go to Jerusalem. One of the places that we went was the garden tomb. What an amazing place that is. We're told in the, in, uh, the New Testament that it is nearby to the place where he was crucified. And as we were standing in the overlook area, there's a handrail there, and the drop-off was probably 25 feet down to a flat area where it's a bus parking lot right now. Um, but on the other side is Golgotha. It's not a huge mountain, but it's a, a cliff, like I say, about 20 or 25 feet, maybe 30 feet high. And the reason it's called Gol Golgotha is the place of the skull. Because you can look at the, the depressions in the, in the face of that cliff and you can see two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And the people called it the place of the skull. And that's where Jesus was crucified. That's where Jesus died, where his blood, where his blood ran down the cross to cover your sins. And to cover mine. And if you turn from that vantage point and turn and go down a path just maybe a hundred yards, it might not have even been that far, 
you're in the garden where the tomb is. We had the opportunity to see the tomb. This was hewn out of solid rock. Only a wealthy man can do that. To have a tomb with two rooms hewn out of solid rock. He was... uh, I lost my place. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. And that's what we saw. The rich man's tomb. John 19, um, verses 38 to 42. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, and the custom of the Jews is to bury. Um, Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. More than a thousand years before this, Isaiah said this is going to happen. Exactly as he said. He was buried with the transgressors, but he was buried, or he, excuse me, he died for the transgressors said that wrong again he died with the transgressors but he was buried in a rich man's tomb another fulfillment of this prophecy is that he will justify many from their sins once again in romans the fifth chapter verses 15 to 19 but the free gift is not like the offense for if by one man's offense many died Much more, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though one man's offense, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, The free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's obedience, many were made, excuse me, one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Also, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Continuing in the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, he will die with transgressors. Luke twenty two thirty seven. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. He's talking to the disciples and to those who are listening. And Jesus is saying, for I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's telling everyone, he is going to die and be counted with the transgressors. That's profound. We need to consider that. Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy that Isaiah prophesied that was given to him by God And Jesus says, I must be killed and be counted with the transgressors. 
In Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to those who were bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our Lord, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. This is what got Jesus in trouble with those who would not listen, to those who said, this can't be the Messiah, this can't be the Son of God, wasn't he Joseph's son? But this is the very place where Jesus says, <clears throat> this prophecy has been fulfilled today in your presence. The prophecy from a thousand years ago, once again, it's perfect. The fulfillment of this prophecy is perfect. But I do want to take uh, just a few more minutes and say so many of the prophecies that we look at and we can see perfectly how they have been fulfilled. There's another prophecy. He's coming again. And it will be perf uh, fulfilled perfectly because we serve a perfect God. Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 6. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her by way of the seas beyond the Jordan, the Galilee, uh, the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. You have multiplied the nations and increased its joy. They rejoice before you, and, and you, before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoiced when they divide the spoil, for you have broken the yoke of this burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as the day of Midian, for every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle, the garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and the fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Or the uh, increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's going to happen. This prophecy is going to be fulfilled perfectly as every other prophecy has already been. We have not seen this happen yet, but it will. Christ is coming again. We don't know when. I believe it's going to be soon. Because as I look around and I see what's happening in the world, prophecy is being fulfilled daily. We see it with Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen. We see it in the Ukraine. We see it in Russia. We see it with the sword rattling of China. We see all of this. It's happening now. It's preparing. I believe it's near. And there's nothing frightening about that. It's glorious. Because his prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Jesus Christ is coming again. He will set up his government. As this prophecy says, the government will be on his shoulders. That hasn't happened yet. He came at the first advent but the government wasn't on his shoulders. However, this prophecy will be fulfilled. Jesus Christ will sit as king in Jerusalem and he will reign and all nations 
will know who he is. I'm thankful. And I appreciate the fact that all of the prophecies have been and are being fulfilled. When is the second coming? We don't know. When is the church age going to end? We don't know. But we do know that it's going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. Are you going to see Jesus Christ face to face? Are you going to? You will either bow the knee now or you will bow the knee later. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, your, your prophecies through your oracles are so amazing. And everything that you have said has either come to pass or is coming to pass. We have a guarantee. We have an ironclad promise that these things are coming. I pray that everyone in this room tonight is ready for them. Will the trumpet be sounding tonight? We don't know. But we do know if we're ready to hear it. And I pray that there's not one person in this room tonight that isn't ready to hear that trumpet. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.